that starts with you. So his step one is start from the heart. What is it that motivates you? What makes you happy? What makes you feel challenged? What makes you feel inspired? The second step is to start exploring your passions. What are your dreams? What do you want to achieve with your life? And he would literally have students write these out. Like right now, I want you to go to the wall. I'll have a bunch of, of post-it notes on there, and I want you to start listing six things that make you passionate. The third step: clarify your purpose. My purpose is to one, two, three, four, five, six. Again, talking about you as an individual. Once you got to that point, then you would say, "How are you going to do it? What are your actions going to be? How can you achieve those things that you just told me are your purpose and that are driven by your passions?" Then he would say, "Perform with passion," which to me felt like a black box, like, "Yay, go forward!" Um, and spread your excitement. And then finally, he would say, "Stay your course." His biggest criticism with companies was impatience. He felt like too many business people are always itching for the next best thing and don't even give their good ideas time to mature. So this is where he would start with a company, talking about what their strategic planning should be. He would sit down with their CEO or their senior team or their founder. And start talking about their private passions. How can we turn the things that personally excite us into things that can make money or serve lots of people? It's a different approach. I think it can often end up with the same result. Any questions before I move on from the strategic framework? And remember, we'll have a Q and A section after the break. Okay, good.、Um, so the next step, what I wanted to share with you, and 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 this is is maybe a little unusual for for talk about strategic planning, but I, I think you'll enjoy it.、Um, once I've talked to people about their strategic plan, or in the rare instance where a student who wants to launch a company comes to me and can already articulate their strategic plan in well-defined prose, my next question is, okay, you've convinced me. I think you have an idea. Now, can you go out there and sell it to other people? And that's when people tend to get really nervous. Even when they're confident in their plan, they don't always feel comfortable selling. And some of it is because we rarely talk about in school influence tactics—the things that come naturally to some people that other people actually have to work pretty hard at. But there's a pretty good area of science that, using rigorously conducted experiments, has actually found certain tactics that seem to work well at influencing and persuading people across situations, across organizations, across industries. I want to share with you six key fundamental tactics. That across people, across cultures, across situations, seem to be extremely persuasive at selling your idea, so that once you have your strategy, you can get other people on board. The first is reciprocity, and this is the idea that people can't help but reciprocate favors. It seems to be just coded in our DNA as human beings. We don't like to be in debt to other people, so we reciprocate things that are done to us.、Um, I, I always like this story. So Gary Marshall is a, a television producer.、Uh, since then, he's gone on to be a movie producer. But he was one of the pioneers in, especially American comedies,、um, and and he was working at an early time in the development of the TV industry. the The popular perception around the world is that free speech is sacred in America. And in some ways, that's true. But there are actually huge restrictions to speech, even in the United States. In fact, everything that is said on network television has to go through a panel of censors, 
who watch and decide whether it's appropriate for people to see. And they can decide with absolutely complete power whether or not a word or a phrase or a storyline or a situation might be offensive or inappropriate, and then it's removed from television. A lot of people don't know this. In the early days of television, these censors were extremely conservative. Really, really conservative. They've loosened up a little bit over the years, but Gary Marshall was one of the first television producers to kind of go head to head with the censors and push the boundaries of what was considered acceptable on television. And these are some of the quotes that he said about how he got them to do this.、Um, He would say, for example, that on the television show Laverne and Shirley, he would say, We had a situation where Squiggy, a character on the show, is in a rush to get out of his apartment and meet some girls upstairs. He says, Will you hurry up before I lose my lust? I don't even know what that means. It seems so quaint in retrospect. But in the script, we put something even stronger in place of that word. Knowing that the censors would say, Gary, you can't say that on TV. So when they said that, asked him to cut it, he would come back and say, OK, a y sorry, that was an accident. What if instead of saying what I did say, I just said, lose my lust? The censors would say, sure, that sounds great, right? When really that's what he wanted to say all along. But because he gave something up, dropping his original word, he got something else in return that he wouldn't have gotten otherwise. Similarly, he said that on the Happy Day series, the biggest censorship fight was over the word virgin. So, what he did is in one script, he put the word in seven times. He knew the censors would come back and say, You can't say that on TV. But then what he said in response is, well, okay, maybe I can't say it seven times, but what if I just say it once? He gave up six instances of the word, but he got to keep one. He wouldn't have been able to say it once if he had started with that. He said he did the same thing with the word pregnant, which at the time was not allowed to be said on American TV. So, this is a great study that was done by a colleague of mine、uh, who was at Berkeley and is now at Stanford. He wanted to understand how do people value favors. So, if we think about the favors that we do for each other all the time, what type of value can be placed on those favors? So, he would ask both the person who was giving the favor and the person who was receiving the favor to place a value on it. And he did it at two points in time. Once right after it happened, and once about a month later. Check out the results. Right after the favor was condu conducted, immediately after, you notice that the giver, the person who actually did the favor, barely values it at all. But for the receiver, there is huge value. But that asymmetry disappears with time. One month later, Eh, favor's a favor. So, what do you take from this graph? Well, a favor is never as valuable as when it's fresh. And these don't have to be big things. There's an asymmetry in how we think about favors. When somebody does a favor for us, we value it much more than they do. Which means we're more likely to turn around and do big things in return. So, the second tactic is scarcity. The idea here is that when something becomes scarce, when it becomes rare, it actually becomes more valuable to us. Even to the point where it's no longer rational, even when it doesn't even make sense how valuable it is to us. We can't help it. We like things that are rare. There are legitimate ways of using this to your own power, and there are somewhat illegitimate ways. Legitimate ways of using scarcity are to find things that actually are rare. What are things that you do that no one else can do? 
What are aspects of your strategic plan that are unique, that are rare? If you highlight them as being scarce, rare, unique, they're going to be valued more highly by your audience. There are also somewhat illegitimate ways of thinking about this, like when you see people who are marketing their store as supplies are limited, act now, even when you know the supplies aren't really limited. I always love when you're in New York City and you see those stores that have the going out of business signs that are faded because they've been up for so many years. Psychologists talk about this in terms of psychological reactants. Um, basically, the idea that we hate to lose freedoms. We like to be free. So when somebody tries to put constraints on us, tries to take away our freedom, we actually get pretty angry and we react out because of it. Why do we do this way? Because we actually see our freedom as a scarce resource. So when we lose this scarce resource, when it's highlighted to us how scarce, how fragile, how vulnerable it is, we actually change our behavior. So an example of this comes from an experiment where uh, real people were asked to pretend to be jury members and they were presented evidence from an automobile injury case. And the question for the jury members was, how much would you award the victim? And they were put in one of three conditions. In the first condition, the jury was told that the driver had no insurance. In the second situation, the second condition, the jury was told that the driver has insurance. So in other words, the money that you award isn't coming out of the driver's pocket, it's coming from the insurance company. And in the third condition, the jury was told the driver has insurance, but do not take that into account. You cannot use that information in making your decision. Disregard the fact that you know that the driver has insurance. When they were told the driver has no insurance, they awarded about $35,000. When they were told that the driver did have insurance, they awarded about $5,000 more, because I guess, eh, it's free money, it's coming from the insurance company, might as well. If people were rational, their answer to the third situation would be exactly the same as one of the other two, right? it should be somewhere in the $30,000 to $40,000 range. The second you tell someone that they have to do something or they can't do something, basically when you put constraints on their freedom, they act out. If I tell someone that they can't take into account the driver's insurance, boom, the driver is now paying 50 grand. The next tactic is authority. And the idea here is that regardless of how right someone is, regardless of the actual content of a message, we tend to apply greater weight, greater legitimacy, and greater value to things we hear that come from sources of authority. And it's amazing what can actually make people think that there's authority involved. So studies suggest that we think people have more authority when some legitimate things happen. So if somebody has unique expertise or seniority or rank, we tend to give them the benefit of authority. But we also give taller people more of a sense of authority. If you have gray hair, bonus points. People with gray hair, even if they're not older, get uh, authority marks. Eyeglasses. If you are wearing eyeglasses, audiences will see you as having more authority. If you're dressed in a way that conveys authority, so for example, if you're wearing a suit or if you're in a uniform, even if you're not actually supposed to be in the uniform, we tend to give you authority. British accents. I don't know what is up with this, but in studies conducted all around the world, including in the UK, Audiences say that people who speak with a British accent have more authority than the exact same speaker 
with any other type of accent. If you want to be heard, develop a British accent. And finally, the depth of your voice, how deep you can speak, conveys authority. What's amazing is this applies equally for men and women. One of the ways we coach female executives to be more impactful, more effective in an organizational context is to actually teach them how to speak in a lower register. Crazy that in this day and age, things like that even matter, but they do. They seem to be hardwired into us, so you might as well take advantage of them. A few other things that you can do beyond these superficial, sort of irrational things to improve the content of your message. One is the use of statistics. It turns out if you use statistics or numbers in support of your argument, people will think it's more accurate, even if you use the statistics wrong, even if the statistics work against you. The presence of statistics makes people think you have authority, expertise. But even better than statistics is a powerful personal story. An anecdote, a sample size of one, told in vivid ways, trumps all statistics. Knowledge specificity, expertise, is the easiest way to convey authority. And what's interesting is that studies have tried introducing that expertise at different points in a speaker's presentation. At the beginning, in the middle, or at the end. It turns out that the best time to assert your authority is at the beginning. Even if you hear it later in a message, you actually don't go back and update your opinions about the speaker. So the first thing I tell people in any speech, in any pitch I get, is straight off the bat, first thing out of your mouth, tell me why I should be listening to you. Because I won't care later. <laughs> the fourth tactic is called commitment and consistency. And the idea here is that once we step foot in one direction, we don't like to change course. And since we know that about people, we can actually predict how to cultivate messages in ways that will be most influential, most impactful. One way salespeople have been using this for years is called the four walls technique. The idea here is to ask a series of questions that basically form walls around the, the, the target, so that at the end, the target can't help but do exactly what you want them to do. An example would be back in, in the day when there were door-to-door -door encyclopedia salesmen. They would come to the door, and they would start with a simple question. Is a good education important to your kids? Of course. Who says no? Do, your ki do kids who do homework get better grades? Well, sure, yeah. Do reference books, encyclopedias, help kids do their homework better? OK, that sounds reasonable. I sell reference books. May I come in to talk to you about it? How do you say no at that point? Right? You've already led them in. If you say no, then you were either lying in one of the previous questions, or you don't care about your kids. That's how encyclopedia salesmen hawked books. Here's a different example. Let's say that you're supporting a political candidate who's running for office, and they're going around and asking people to put advertisements in their front lawn, basically promoting them. Do you go up to people and say, can I put a really ugly, large public message in your yard for three weeks? Or, well, so yeah, if you, if you do that, less than one in five people, about 17% of people will say yes. The science seems to support this across situations. But what if you first ask people, would you be willing to sign a petition that supports anti-littering legislation? Nobody wants to sign a petition. People hate petitions. 
But if you ask them that first, whether they say yes or no, it doesn't even matter. And then you follow up with, and can I put a large public service sign in your yard for three weeks? 76% of people will say yes to the sign. You bring your acceptance rate from 17% to 76% just by asking a different question first. You don't even have to care about the petition. There doesn't even have to be a real petition. Even more, if you start any request with, can you do me a favor? The percentage of people who will comply with the request goes through the roof. Because once somebody asks you, can you do me a favor, which of course they reply yes to, because who says, no, I can't do you a favor? Once somebody's committed to that, yes, I have the power to do you a favor, they're then reluctant to turn around and say, eh, but I'm not really willing to do you that favor. Some of this comes from the psychological principle of cognitive dissonance. And the idea here is that we as human beings like to think that we're rational. We want to believe that we have control over our minds, that we're not just animals responding to instincts, but that we are smart and reasonable and can think about evidence and ammunition and, and, and really develop cogent thought that's consistent over time. Even though in reality, we often do things that are unexplainable or irrational. Um, so, for example, somebody could say something like, gosh, I'm putting up with a lot of crap at work. I hate my boss. They never let me have a weekend. I haven't seen my bed in two weeks. This must be a great job. Because what's the alternative? The alternative is, I'm stupid. Right? I'm willing to put up with way more than I should. I have no sense of self-worth or the value of my time. Or I have no other options in the marketplace to go get a better job. Those are my options. <laughs> I would rather think, gosh, I have a great job. I'm so lucky to have this job. In the United States, you see this uh, dynamic at work with fraternities and sororities at universities all the time. These fraternities and sororities make it extremely difficult for new members to join. Um, traditionally, they've gone through periods of several months of what's called hazing, where the existing members basically torture the wannabe new members for months. Um, there have been examples of extreme forms of physical torture, mental torture, emotional torture. It's agonizing. No one looks back at their hazing experience and goes, that was a great experience. But why do we keep doing it? Because once you've gone through the hazing, you have to decide, in order to think yourself consistent, why did I do this? Did I do it because I like abuse and torture? No, I did this because this is an organization I desperately want to belong to because it's going to be good for me socially, it's going to be good for my career prospects, this is an organization worth belonging to. <laughs> so <laughs> here's another experiment. I, I love this one. Um, subjects were asked to do a task, and after the task, they were asked to rate how much they enjoyed doing the task. Now, the task either involved telling the truth about something, or the subject was told to lie. Now, if they were told to lie, they were told either that they would be paid $20 in return for lying, or they would be paid $1 in return for lying. When controls in the control condition, where subjects weren't asked to lie, were told to tell the truth, they rated their enjoyment just south of an eight. When they received $20, it didn't really change. I still just enjoyed it what I enjoyed it. When they were only paid $1, a token sum, their enjoyment went through the roof. Why? Because they were being asked to compromise their moral beliefs. They were being asked to lie. And they were only being paid a dollar. So the reality is, either their moral beliefs can be bought 
by a dollar. Or this must be an amazing experiment that I love participating in. The next dimension is called social proof, and this is the idea that fundamentally, at our hearts, we're social animals. I've noticed it in Kuwait when I go to the malls. I've noticed it when I look in restaurants. But in truth, it's how we think about our organizations too. We want things that we see other people wanting. We do things that we see other people doing. And you can actually predict this happening. So, for example, when you watch television programs and they have a laugh track, right? When you hear other people laughing during the program, it actually makes people think the program's funnier. Bartenders、um, and and restaurant workers will often put a tip jar out, right? And it's common practice that at the beginning of the shift, you do what's called salting the tip jar. You put a few dollars in it. Why in the world would you put your own money in the tip jar? Because when other people see the tip jar and see that it's partially full, they just automatically put money in. Stores that promote or restaurants that promote our most popular item is blank. Turns out, if a restaurant menu just includes the word "signature dish," the sales of that item go through the roof relative to everything else on the menu. You can direct people where you want them to go just by providing social proof. And finally, the last dimension before we take the break、um, is the idea of liking. We're more influenced, more persuaded by people we like, and what's crazy is sometimes we like people for reasons we don't even know. For example, studies suggest that more attractive people are more likable. People who are more like us are also more likable. We like people who are like us. People who are familiar to us are more likable. What's amazing is all it takes is seeing the same person every day for a week, and your assessment of their attractiveness doubles. So if you want to get somebody to accept your offer to a date, all you have to do is cross paths with them over and over and over again until you skew their criteria. <laughs> and perhaps most telling. We like people who like us. As self-serving as it sounds, we tend to think we're pretty cool. Somebody else who agrees with us must have good taste. So there was a study where we watched MBA students, Master of Business Administration, graduate students going into careers in business, and we started rating them. Uh, or well, we actually, when we had the recruiters come on campus, we asked recruiters to rate these MBAs on their level of ingratiating behavior. Basically, how much did these students suck up to the recruiters? It turned out <laughs> that the students who sucked up the most, who were the most ingratiating, had 1.45, almost 50 percent more offers. And not only that. But their initial offers for their salaries were over $1,500 more. When I tell people that that they're like, sure, we like people who suck up to us, but to a point, right? At a certain point, it becomes annoying. According to this study, no, there was no ceiling effect. People could actually be so ingratiating that all the recruiters called them annoying, and they still got more offers and were offered more money. Even more telling, before the recruiters show up on campus, we warn them that MBA students tend to be pretty ingratiating, and that research suggests that people who suck up to us tend to get better offers. It didn't change their behavior. However, you could imagine that in a situation, particularly one where you see the same person over and over again through time, being extremely ingratiating might backfire. But I have yet to see a study that proves that it does. We like people who like us. So that's all I have for this first half.、Um, 
What I want to do now is take a 30-minute break, and when we come back, I'd love to open this up for discussion. I want to hear about the challenges you're facing, the questions you have, and we can turn the tables and really talk about you for a while. So let's take a break, 30 minutes. <laughs>